Hello, I'm Kevin Benedict, Senior Vice President of Solution Strategy at Regalix. And I want to thank all of you guys for joining today. Today, this is part of the CIO Water Coolers IT Leadership Series. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Christine Ashton. Christine, thanks for joining us. Well, hello, Kevin, and thanks very much for having me. Really Absolutely. excited to be here. So let me continue the introduction with you, Christine. You are the Global C uh, Chief Digital Officer for the Digital Office ERP Cloud at SAP. That is a great and long title. Talk to us about that, Christine. Well, it is, it is. And, uh, you know, I, I do a couple of things. So as you say, uh, CDO for the uh, Esfahana Public Cloud ERP. And, you know, I've been um, an SAP customer probably for 30 years, uh, probably longer. Um, and so I've got a unique position in that, you know, I understand what it's like to work in business. I understand what it's like to have to face your board, the, the CFO, the CEO, when, you know, that when they've got high expectations. And I understand what it's like to run an IT uh, capability. And now, increasingly, I know what it's like to work for, uh, you know, one of the world's biggest software companies, particularly as we're embarking, like lots of companies are, on, you know, moving our products uh, to be cloud only. So it's quite a unique position to be in. Um, the second thing I would tell you is that I'm also an independent non-executive director for the National Payments Systems Operator in the UK. And, you know, that is about uh, further developing the capability of the UK retail payment systems uh, to meet the needs of the 21st century. Uh, so I see wow. collecting these long titles. <laughs> Absolutely. So what do you get to do on an average day? What kinds of problems do you get to jump in and help solve? Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, one is from an internal perspective. You know, I'm working with our products people, our marketing people in helping them to think and feel and have empathy with our customers and to really understand the issues that they're grappling with. Uh, because as we all know, you know, technology isn't just one thing anymore. And people are grappling with uh, compliance issues, regulatory issues, uh, mergers, acquisitions, divestments. Uh, data, you know, so helping people internally in the company to think that through and think how we message that, particularly in a, a ERP cloud world, is really important. Um, the second thing I help to do is work with our customers because, you know, thinking about how you chart your way to the cloud can be a bit daunting. So helping people to think about how they identify areas that would be a great way to start the journey to the cloud and would deliver instant, uh, very quick benefits is something that I do. And also I help you know, educate not only um, our customers, uh, staff, but also our partners. You know, many software companies would be nothing if it wasn't for their partners and their partner network. And of course, as well as us, starting to think about what it's like to be uh, uh, an ERP public cloud provider, they're having to think through what it's like to develop new services that they can sell to the market to help our customers implement and be successful in the cloud. Got it. So Christine, you talked about the benefits, you know, helping the customers understand the benefits and going along this journey of moving to the cloud. What are some of the motivating factors that would actually take companies to the cloud? Well, a couple of things. And, you know, it obviously depends on where companies are in their various life cycles. So one big motivating factor that we're seeing is that to create growth and to create more value, a lot of companies are divesting, they are acquiring, they're going into new joint ventures, and they're also trying out new and different business models. And if you think about it, if you can use an intelligent cloud ERP that you can implement in a matter of weeks, 
it means that you get to try out particularly new business models in a way that's safer, better, faster. And also, you know, if you decide maybe it's not for me anymore, it's something that you can very quickly unwind if you need to, you know. Oh, so those are some of the motivating factors uh, we're seeing, as well as, you know, some of the more conventional and perhaps more down-to-earth ones of companies wanting to save costs, not run their own infrastructure anymore, uh, probably spend less than 70% of their budgets just maintaining and uh, patching uh, application software, and starting to really spend more of their money, time, and effort innovating and bringing new capabilities into their companies. Interesting. So how are those motivations kind of impacted by the need to digitally transform as well? Well, you know, um, it's really interesting, isn't it? If you look at the index of your choice, be it the Standard & Poor or, or any of these indexes, you start to see that the lifetime of a company is decreasing quite quickly. I think in 1958, uh, not that I can remember then, but in 1958, the uh, average lifetime of a company was about 60 years. You know, these days, it's more it's more like 15 years. So, you know, an employee's career tenure is starting to be longer than the companies they work in, right? So, uh, you know, where that starts to get you is that companies haven't got the time to spend on big, long rollouts. They haven't got the time to be building their infrastructure, what they need to be doing is acquiring it and acquiring it very quickly. And I think, you know, that's that's another motivator as to why companies are looking for better ways to transform. Uh, I think it's also about the fact that business models are changing much faster. Uh, customers' expectations are changing. And, you know, it's not good enough now just to be able to transact you have to deliver added value and added value services. And if you were to try and develop systems to do that, as well as develop systems to just do the basics, then I think you just can't compete. So, yeah. yeah. So I think one of the big motivators is if, if I can buy in processes, particularly the commodity ones that are just good enough to be able to bill, to be able to procure, to be able to run my HR, then actually that's something I'm, I'm really going to do. And one of the things that companies like SAP have been very good at is over the 45 years that SAP has been in business, they've been identifying what these core processes need to look like and what looks good uh, in terms of these processes for companies. And then what we've done is we've then implemented those processes in this intelligent cloud ERP. And companies can then buy it as a service. And, you know, it means that all the basics, you could argue, are done for them. But that's not just, you know, all of the story. You know, we're continuing to add new capability in there. But for the sake of the question, you know, what it means is that companies don't have to worry about spending precious time building and integrating all of those basic sort of capabilities anymore. Or mode one, as Gartner uh, refers to it as, what they can do is fast track straight to mode two. And again, we're starting to build very innovative capabilities into the uh, intelligent cloud ERP. And we're updating that all the time, every quarter, in fact. And I think what it means is that companies uh, can be really starting to think through what their businesses look like and how they can make them much more agile, you know? Absolutely. So are you seeing some processes lend itself to, to being supported in the cloud um, in, a, in an environment like SAP has and others are too fast moving, so they have to be done through either custom work or smaller kind of add-on? Um, technologies. What do you see out there? Are there some that fit better than others? Well, I would say that all of them can fit, right? However, however, what I would say is that technology is not standing still, right? And it's easy to think that maybe cloud is limitations, but, you know, as we develop cloud out, 
then edge compute starts to come in. Mm. So I think that any process you couldn't get to work in cloud, you could get it to work in a combination of cloud and edge compute, right? Mm. So some of the, I'll give you an example of some of the things that we're seeing. We're seeing companies uh, look at things like the traditional assets, be they, let's pick on something like industrial freezers for argument's sake. Mm -hmm. So, you know, industrial freezers, uh, companies are now looking at how you can put IoT on those and not just boring IoT, this is really smart IoT that you can integrate with your ERP. The IoT can tell when there's a problem with the freezers, it can triage the faults, it can call out the right type of engineer to fix it, it can work out how much wastage there's been in, in the freezer. If, however, there's, there's say four hours before the uh, food spoils, it can in conjunction with the ERP work out where you could send that food to, be that a food bank, a hospital, or a local business nearby. And then what it can work out is, and I'm so excited about all of this, then it can work out when it can put itself back in service. And then it can tell the ERP to pay the engineer that fixed it. Uh, I love it. The end to end, the complete cycle, isn't it? And I think that's what the difference is, Kevin. You know, that's the corner we've turned, I think, that we're no longer just doing bits of processes in one system and bits in another or bits on a cloud and bits on on premises. We're now able to transact these end to end scenarios end to end in the cloud. And you asked about, you know, was was cloud good enough? Again, if we go back to the freezer example, you know, you can always use edge compute if your freezers are out in, I don't know, Minneapolis or Yorkshire or somewhere, you know, Scotland or maybe somewhere there where the broadband connection is not that good, just for example, I know we're joking here. But so edge computers then got a role to play. And I think, and so the cycle of technology goes on and on really in terms of the further it goes, the pervasiveness. And, and I just think that it'll be, if we were back here probably in a year's time, there'd be nothing that you can't do on cloud. Oh, wow. So I know you have a lot of history and a lot of experience in the financial industry. But are you is um, do you see particular industries or verticals out there that are embracing cloud ERP environments more than others? Well, I think what's really interesting about what we see is that finance directors and finance organizations really are grappling, grappling, <laughs> grasping cloud by the neck. Right. So I think for so long um, they've they've been focused on maybe a transaction type of working and have spent not as much time as they would have liked predicting where the companies could go and forecasting rather than looking in the rear view mirror. And what I see is finance transformation really leading the charge on how cloud can be used as uh, a transformer of the way uh, things get done. And in a way that with some of the modern intelligent cloud ERP like ours, you know, you can teach it rules, you can teach it how to do things, you can then encode those rules in what we call robotic process automation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you can teach it how to match invoices, you can teach it how to do a lot of the tasks that if you talk to the average finance director, they will admit that either they have people that work for them directly doing that type of work, or indirectly via service centers and, and service companies. And it's not that they want those jobs to disappear. What they would rather have is somebody predicting which customers will buy more products or which customers are likely to be more profitable if they change their pricing scenarios, for example. Oh um, yeah, so find ways of optimizing the time they spend with your company. Totally, totally. Because, you know, we were talking earlier about new business models. Well, you know, the new business models mean that we have to think about different ways to price things. Uh, it's more about subscription, perhaps, and pay to use rather than, uh, you know, I just pay for a year 
and maybe I only use, you know, five things. Um, so it's about paying to use, uh, subscribing in a different way. And, and I think that the more people want to go to those sorts of business models, then the more they will need, you know, better, better types of systems. So, Christine, talk to me about the regulatory environment. Is it easier for companies to support various regula uh, regulations around the globe if they're supporting ERP in the cloud rather than trying to customize and make sure they're compliant with their own on-premise systems? Uh, for example, let's just consider GDPR, you know, the um, uh, uh, privacy regulations coming down. Is that easier to support in the cloud than it would be on premise? Well, I think there's a number of things to consider. Number one is, you know, over the years, we've all built up lots of customization. And I think it's often hard for companies to work out just how data flows through their systems. Mm -hmm. I think you asked a lot of companies, hey, which ones of your systems use customer data and, and what happens to it? How does it get amended and deleted? I think a lot of companies would really struggle to tell you that, right? And one important aspect of uh, GDPR is, is this notion of the right to be forgotten. So if you think about that, if you've got a very distributed application uh, landscape and you, Kevin, phones me up and says, Christine, I want to be forgotten. You know, I could, I could have a big task on to go through all my systems, you know, deleting you, uh, you know, and making sure that you were out of a whole landscape and any processes I use, say for argument's sake, a returns process or a customer acquisition process. So I think that moving to cloud, <clears throat> number one, if you're using standard processes, fit to standard out of the box, like we do in our intelligent ERP, you know what they are, you know what de you're dealing with, you know how they work, which I think is a bonus over, um, you know, things that you might have customized yourself over the years. So that, that's one thing I would say. I think the second thing is, like any other move to a new system, when you're setting up roles and responsibilities afresh, and you're setting up uh, data models and how you use data afresh, then you know you can document it, you can put rules behind it, um, you can use the latest technology to help you to run routines to um, check who's using what, and you know, like we were just saying before, to make sure things get deleted. So, so I think those are a lot of the benefits. I think the, the third really big benefit is the fact that you know with a, our intelligent erp cloud you're not customizing it or changing the code yourself so all of the time you can attest that the code's never changed and there haven't been those sorts of changes that undermine how your data uh, is being used in the systems and again uh, i think that's much easier to enable you to know where you stand uh it makes perfect sense to me so you use the term here, intelligent ERP. And I know today uh, everybody's talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence, et cetera. What do you guys mean by intelligent ERP? Well, what we mean by that is this idea that it's, it's, it's not about being a passive back office type of concept. This is about an ERP that, for example, uh, in our system, we've built in this idea of a co-pilot. So uh, it's, it's like having this extra intelligence helping you do your job that, for example, if you were running a warehouse, it would know where, where things were in the warehouse. You could tell it to know which customers were ordering uh, what and how many they were ordering. And perhaps you, it could understand how they were running out of your product and it could help you to automatically reorder. So it's this idea that you've got a buddy, a co-pilot, helping you to make sure that your customers get serviced right, that if you're running out of things, it alerts you, and it just generally works with you, not against you, and it's predictive, not reactive, and, um, and uh, you know, it's also uh, making, making much more use of machine learning, uh, real-time analytics um, and for example you know instead of waiting a month to close your book 
risks and then worry about profitability, you know, what our intelligent ERP can do is do what we call a soft close. So it can close the books anytime you like, and you can start to really analyze what the uh, p and is going to look like, and you've got time to do something about it if you need to. So it's this oh. idea that it's predictive, it's real time, it's working with you, uh, it's helping to come up with scenarios on your behalf, and you know, ultimately scenarios that will help you add more value for your customer and be more profitable. So, Christine, talk to me about how you guys are kind of stacking that uh, intelligent level, that artificial intelligence. Is that something that's built into just all components or is that a is that a standalone category of solution that SAP has? Or again, is that just part of everything now? Well, like a lot of companies, you know, we have like a portfolio of solutions. So uh, our intelligent ERP integrates with a lot of our other products, be they our products for HR, our products for suppliers, our products for expenses. Um, you know, we also have a, a concept called uh, SAP Cloud Platform, which integrates into our IoT capability through uh, Leonardo. I know these are a lot of names, but you know, we've taken the best capabilities and we've engineered them in a way that means that they natively integrate, operate in real time, and you know they can be put together as and when um, you know a company needs to to suit their their needs. But more importantly, they'll scale with you. And I and I think that that's something that uh, it is is really positive for the future. And it's a real change from the past when you know we used to spend so much time upgrading patching and uh you know just generally putting a big closed sign on the business because we were busily installing the latest software and you know sap today uh, currently supports around 140 million end users worldwide uh, through our cloud only products which are the ERP, hr uh, expenses uh, suppliers uh, you know and and there's probably a few more that I've, that I've not mentioned, but you know, it's a, it's a massive portfolio. And I, I think it's a massive undertaking to engineer the way we have done to create this uh, fantastic capability. Absolutely. So, uh, I, and I've been around SAP um, for decades, so I can appreciate that whole evolution of where SAP was and how it's progressing and now moving into the cloud. Listen, you brought up earlier robotic process automation, RPA. Where do you see that being implemented and kind of what's what's executives, what are the strategies executives are implementing there? Well, I think that there's a couple of things to think of there. I think a lot of people have had to, to help their companies grow and be able to start doing what we would call the mode to the innovation. People have had to perhaps use service centers, they've had to think about outsourcing. And I think actually, if we're really smart about RPA, we can use it to you know, transact uh, a lot of that type of business that we've historically uh, outsourced. I think the other thing is that you know, we see companies using it to learn more about their customers, uh, to inform call, call centers. Uh, we were talking before about being able to match invoices quicker, better, faster. So, you know, they're using it to make sure they stay current in terms of payments to providers and they stay current in terms of their understanding of their net outgoings and ingoings, you know. Um, I think the other thing is, uh, you know, what we were talking about is starting to use it to build sort of if then else type logic. So if you see this type of situation, this is what I want you to do next. So if reordering levels drop, or if we can estimate that a customer will have used more of our product by a certain time, then let's start to reorder. So, so they're, they're doing the sorts of things that we all used to write on scratch pads, you know, and mm -hmm. little notes to sell. They're using it, it for that sort of thing. And, and indeed, our system has kind of got that type of capability built in. So, uh, you know, it will automatically um, tell itself to do things, if that doesn't sound too what too uh, back to front, uh, you know, without without you having to worry about it, you know. Absolutely. 
So here at Regalix, we do a lot of focus on the customer success or the customer interaction component of the business. Uh, let's talk about how does ERP cloud, how, to, how does robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these fun new kinds of technologies and Internet of Things, all these kind of emerging technologies. How do those actually benefit the customers out there, the end customers that are doing business with SAP users? Right. So what, some, something to think about is to think about that customers and companies these days are not operating on their own anymore. They often operate in an ecosystem of suppliers. And, and I think that the more um, robotic process automation and machine learning can, can create consistency, reliability, um, it knows what to do if there's problems. It means that the whole of the ecosystem can operate much more effectively. And I think, you know, things like Amazon are a brilliant example of a complex uh, ecosystem. And, you know, what that then means is if you're operating more reliably, more consistently, more accurately, then the costs of operating the ecosystem for everybody in it actually become more economical and probably cheaper than they would otherwise be and i think that's going to be where a lot of value comes going forward i think that we will spend less time making business cases on an individual or internal company basis and we'll make more business cases on a sort of ecosystem economics type of idea going forward and um you know i think that RPA and machine learning have just got this ability now to just create so much more consistency and, um, you know, like I said before, you know, less error prone um, between systems, companies, suppliers, customers um, than, than we've seen before. So it sounds like all of that's going to be beneficial for the customer experience in general. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally, because what are the things that, you know, that really upset customers? It's when you behave unpredictably, when you don't do things that you should have done, when things show up on your doorstep, when they were promised the day before. And I think the more we can automate and have those things operate much more streamlined, then the more we will not just improve the customer experience, but be able to talk to the customer about different and better ways we can add value for them. Oh, absolutely. And I know as interactions uh, move from kind of brick and mortar environments more and more to a digital interaction perspective, speed is a very important ingredient of that. Nobody wants to be sitting around waiting for a response to a query on a mobile app that takes, you know, 10 seconds. It needs to be instant. So I imagine there's a benefit having a lot of this connected and automated in the cloud. Yeah. And, and don't forget, you know, um, at one stage, we used to do a transaction on different um, systems. We'd do some bits on our PC, some bits on our iPads. Increasingly, now it's the mobile. And, you know, all of our systems just operate, you know, in that way. And, um, you know, I think that that means that, you know, customers are, you know, expecting to be dealt with in that way as well. And, um, you know, it's just going to make things better, isn't it, going forward? Oh, absolutely. So we've talked about all these kind of innovations and how the industry is evolving and how companies are moving to the cloud. How does this, let's talk, let's kind of move that topic uh, to future. And mm -hmm. let's talk about how does all this impact kind of the future of work out there? Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting, isn't it? So, I mean, I think, you know, we've talked before about STEM and we've talked about careers in computing and we've talked about all of those things. And I think that Historically, probably people like you and I expected to join a company and move up the ladder and uh, do a mundane job first before we got to do an interesting job. And I think that expectations have changed. I think that people come into the workplace looking for purpose and to do things with purpose, and meaning. And I think that the scenarios that we're describing being the sorts of scenarios we're describing mean that I think companies are going to be much more socially responsible. So, you know, people are going to be really clear about how what they're doing creates waste. You know, use of plastic, you know, that's a big one at the moment. They're going to be more concerned about, you know, repeatability and, um, you know, 
like I say, I, I know I'm repeating myself, you know, but but things like waste. And and I think that if we can really show to people in our workplaces how their work directly correlates with profitability, corporate social responsibility, then you know, people will want to work for us. You know, and I think going forward, it's not always about the company that can pay the most money. It's more about the company that is also exploiting technology to move forward, do things better and save even more electricity or move, use more solar power, for example. I think what's also very important about the future is that a lot of the jobs that people will do have yet to be invented. Mm. And, uh, you know, years ago, who, who'd have thought that had been something like a cloud a cloud administrator, you know, for argument's sake, or a cloud architect, you know. And I think that a lot of the job titles and the job capabilities, we don't even know what they are yet. And I think, number one, that's quite hard advising young people what to go study for. But but it also gives us a massive opportunity because there's no precedent set on those jobs. So there's no rules about whether the, you know, male, masculine jobs or feminine jobs or, or whatever type of job. So I think it means that the future workplace will be much, much more um, inclusive. And, um, and then I think that the, um, you know, the third thing is that, um, uh, that the third thing is that technology is something that will always keep improving. And so continuous learning is big. So again, I think that the future workplace is not about struggling to get access to data or struggling to, uh, you know, co-join spreadsheets, but it's going to be more about continuous learning. How can I predict, you know, uh, how can I predict processes better, faster? And and I think that that's that's going to be attractive to the younger generation, quite honestly. Oh, absolutely. So you brought up advice to kids. Let's let, let me ask that kind of question as well. What advice would you give to people entering college? What areas do you think they should they would really benefit from studying? Ah, now that's an interesting question, isn't it? So I suppose I suppose I might be a, a bit smart with them and say focus on capabilities, because I think one of the things I would say on one level, I don't think it necessarily matters what they do, as long as they're doing things like getting good analytical skills, logic, assertion, reasoning. I mean, I was a, a, a chartered chemist first, and I think what that taught me was analytics, uh, how to think about things, how to challenge. So I think it's about whatever subjects they do that they think about that. I also think that being creative going forward is going to be key, being able to look at things in different ways and, you know, having a, having a mindset. So, I mean, I think studying things that opens your mind to different ways of thinking and doing, I think is, is really going to be very, very powerful going forward. Very good. Thanks, Christine, for sharing that with us. Last question here. Let's talk about the future and let's kind of open the curtains and look toward the future. What do you see as some of the most interesting emerging trends that you that you're seeing out there? Um, well, I think that, you know, we've had a lot of um, ambitions as humans to make sure that we kept people protected. We didn't put people in. Uh, scary situations, be that in an oil rig or a factory or a mine or whatever. And I think that increasingly the trends are going to be that all of those types of things are going to be automated and autonomous. And I think that that means that, you know, people will end up doing, you know, better, nicer, cleaner uh, jobs. So I, I think this whole trend to all, towards autonomousness, if that is a word, I, I think you've seen nothing yet. I think that the stuff we're doing with cars is just the tip of the iceberg, quite honestly. Uh, so I think that's certainly, uh, you know, one big trend. And and I think that this whole connectedness just continues apace. Um, and I wouldn't say it's a trend, but almost we dreamed years ago of ubiquitous connectivity, but we thought about it just about Wi-Fi. Now I think you'll see ubiquitous connectivity at a people level, you know, at, at an everything level. And again, I, I don't think we've seen anything yet when it comes to ubiquitous connectivity. And uh, and then I suppose the third thing is just this whole predictiveness. And um, I think that we shouldn't fall into the trap of, of making things like um, uh, robots and all of those be humanoid. 
I think that it's about putting them to good use in the areas we need them. And, you know, I'm hoping that as I get older, you know, I'll have all this capability to uh, help me when I, uh, you know, when, when maybe I can't remember things and it'll predict, you know, I'll have this buddy that can predict what I was going to do next and uh, it can remember what, it, what I went into the kitchen for. <laughs> yes. oh, how exciting. Well, Christine, I want to thank you for dedicating this time to us today. I want to thank the CIL Water Cooler for organizing this IT leadership series. And I want to thank you, the audience, for sticking with us. Thanks a lot, Christine. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin. Cheerio for now. Cheers.